Welcome to White Horse Radar's demonstration video presentation. This video has been produced as a short sample version to promote White Horse Radar's suite of similar but longer videos that teach various aspects of radar and therefore this video may be freely distributed. My name is Clive Alabaster and this short video presentation covers the subject of pulsed radar waveforms using low, high and medium pulsed repetition frequencies. An important feature of pulsed radar is the number of transmitted pulses per second and this is known as its pulse repetition frequency or PRF. Selection of the PRF is a critical aspect of radar design. In the context of pulsed radar, and pulsed Doppler radar in particular, PRFs may be chosen to lie within three ranges – low PRF, high PRF and medium PRF. These three regimes – low, high and medium PRF – impose frequency limits on the PRF that enable the pulsed radar to measure range and or velocity with or without any ambiguity. As such, there are no fixed frequency limits that define the low, high and medium PRF regimes since these limits depend on the detection range of the radar and the relative velocity between the radar and its targets, including clutter returns. These are the issues explained in this short video presentation. This video presentation covers the following topics. We start by considering the features of a pulsed carrier signal in the time domain, that is, its waveform, and in the frequency domain, or its spectrum. The measurement of range is made from the time delay between the transmission of a pulse and the subsequent reception of an echo of that pulse from a target. Since pulse delay ranging happens in the time domain, the signal's waveform is all important. The measurement of velocity is done by sensing the Doppler shift of the target return, that is, the small change in frequency of a received signal with respect to the transmitted signal, which is dependent on the relative velocity between the radar and target. So, target velocity measurement takes place in the frequency domain and therefore it is necessary to consider the signal's spectrum. It turns out that the choice of pulse repetition frequency, the radar's PRF, can result in an ambiguous range measurement. But range ambiguity can be avoided if a suitably low value of PRF is used and this constitutes a low PRF waveform. Similarly, Doppler and hence velocity ambiguity can result from the choice of radar PRF. But this too can be avoided by choosing a suitably high value of PRF and this leads to the notion of a high PRF waveform. In the general case, however, a PRF occupies the middle ground in which both range and velocity may be ambiguous and this is the so-called medium PRF. In spite of the complications of range and velocity ambiguities, medium PRF has several advantages over both low and high PRF waveforms, especially when strong clutter returns are present, that is, the unwanted echo from the surface. Finally, we review a summary of these topics and make a few closing remarks about Whitehorse Radar's video presentations. The numbers in blue to the right are the times at which these various topics start and are given so as to help you fast forward directly to the specific topics should you wish. All three waveforms, low, high and medium PRF, have relative strengths and weaknesses and all three have applications in pulse Doppler radar. We start by considering the waveform and spectrum of a pulsed radar signal.
We start by looking at the pulsed carrier as a function of time. Here we see a series of rectangular pulses of RF at a regular pulsing frequency. For pulsed Doppler radar, these pulses must be coherent. That is, successive pulses have a fixed phase difference that depends only on the carrier frequency and the time between pulses. Also, this coherency must be preserved when echoes of these pulses are received and passed along the receiver. We note the time between pulses, the pulse repetition interval, PRI, usually referred to as the time TR. And since TR is the period of the pulsed modulation, its inverse is the pulse repetition frequency, the PRF, and is the number of pulses per second. The PRF is often given the symbol FR. We note also the duration of each pulse, the pulse width, TOR. We'll assume that these parameters are held constant. Transforming a burst of coherent pulses to the frequency domain results in the spectrum of the signal. Since our pulse signal was periodic, the resulting spectrum is given by a Fourier series. In other words, the spectrum consists of a series of lines denoting a host of discrete frequencies over a wide bandwidth. Pulsed modulation is an extreme form of amplitude modulation, and this is characterized by the spectrum of the modulation envelope being reproduced above and below the carrier frequency, which here is the frequency of the transmitted carrier, FTX, at the center of the spectrum. The amplitudes of the spectral lines are indicated by the dotted line, and this is a classic sync function. This continues to diminish at ever greater offsets above and below the central carrier frequency, and in theory never becomes zero, but in practice will eventually die away to a level below the background noise level. Only the first few lobes of the sync function envelope are shown here. The spectral components have a regular spacing frequency and is given by the inverse of the PRI, that is, the PRF. In this way, the spectral lines are offset from the central carrier frequency by multiples of the PRF. The sync function exhibits nulls between a sequence of lobes, the frequency offset from the central carrier component to the first null is given by the inverse of the pulse width, 1 over tor, and this is also equal to the offset between subsequent nulls. The pulse width, therefore, determines the bandwidth of the spectrum. We have now established the features of the signal in both the time and frequency domains that will help us understand range and velocity measurement. We'll start with range. Here we see an airborne pulsed radar with several targets and surface clutter within its main beam. The pulsed modulation and a clock waveform are also shown. The modulation waveform goes high to indicate a transmitted pulse and remains low during the receiving time between pulses. The clock marks out regular increments of time throughout the receiving period. This has the effect of quantizing time into a series of range gates or range cells or range bins as they are known. The width of each range gate is normally set to the inverse of the signal bandwidth assuming matched filter reception as illustrated here. Individual range gates isolate returns from a thin volume of space within the beam. Ground targets are detected in a range gate in which the thin volume of space intersects the ground. The ground itself is an example of a highly extended target. It does not exist at just one point in range, but is spread in range, and hence there is a continuum of returns from the ground occupying several successive range gates. This is usually regarded as a surface clutter return.
Some targets may coincide with the ground return, as for all ground-based targets like the tank here, and others, such as the aircraft, may not. Here we see the radar beam and the modulation envelope cycling between transmission and reception, aligned with each other on the left. If we introduce a target into the beam, then we see its response in the appropriate range gate of the receiving period, but because the modulation is periodic, we also see the target response in the equivalent range gate of the next receiving period. In fact, the target response would also be periodic and so appear in the same range gate in all receiving periods for as long as the target remains in the beam at its particular range. The time delay between the transmitted pulse and the subsequent reception of the target response is time t. In fact, the same delay time t is repeated in each receiving period. The time t is related to the radar range r via this equation. This equation is no more than a version of the well-known distance equals speed times time relationship. In this particular case, the speed is the speed at which the RF signal propagates, which is the speed of light, and is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second in free space. The time is the delay t, as measured by the range gating function of the radar. Finally, there is the division by 2, because we are interested in the one-way range whereas the signals have made the two-way, out-and-back journey. We now turn our attention to the measurement of velocity of a target relative to the radar. This is accomplished by determining the Doppler shift frequency of a target return relative to the transmitted signal. Therefore, to a radar, the measurement of velocity is tantamount to the measurement of frequency. Doppler processing operates in the frequency domain, and so we must now consider the spectrum of the radar signals. Here we see the three central frequency components of the transmitted signal as a function of the Doppler shift frequency. The central carrier frequency has zero Doppler shift, and we can also see the first PRF lines above and below the carrier sitting at plus and minus FR. These three lines would also depict the three central components of a received signal having zero Doppler shift after coherent down conversion to a complex baseband signal. Either way, these three components provide us with a useful reference of a zero Doppler shifted return. Returns from a moving target will be Doppler shifted, either with a positive Doppler, should the target be closing towards the radar, or a negative Doppler, should it be receding away from the radar. Fast Fourier transform FFT, techniques applied to a sequence of returns result in a series of filters that form Doppler gates, or Doppler cells, or Doppler bins, as they are variously known. These filters measure the Doppler shift. The filters, or Doppler cells immediately above the 0 Hz center, measure positive Doppler arising from closing targets. And the Doppler cells immediately below the first PRF line measure the negative Doppler shift arising from receding targets. This processing must be applied across a total Doppler bandwidth equal to the PRF, since this will always capture one, and only one, frequency component of the received signal for each moving target. We can see how the FFT processing results in a series of N filters that subdivide the Doppler band into quantized frequency intervals, the N Doppler cells. The number n is known as the FFT point size. For historical reasons, 
FFT processing in real time required n to be a power of 2, although this need no longer be the case. 32-point processing is illustrated here, and you can see how the filters are numbered from 0 to 31, or in general from 0 to n minus 1. It may seem a little odd to see the negative Doppler filters as they are shown here. We can alternatively depict them immediately below the central component, like this. The Doppler filters now cover the band of minus a half the PRF to plus a half the PRF. This may be a rather more intuitive depiction of the Doppler band, but it is entirely consistent with the original depiction and crucially still shows the Doppler bandwidth to be PRF wide. Here we see an example of a Doppler shifted target response in Doppler filter number 4. The Doppler frequency of this target is given by the displacement of this filter from the 0 Hz center. The Doppler filters can be scaled to velocity and so can be thought of as a set of velocity gates or bins or cells. The target response in Doppler cell 4 corresponds to a Doppler shift of 1 8th the PRF for the example of 32 point FFT processing shown here. The relationship between Doppler shift and relative velocity is given by the equation here and substitution of the measured Doppler shift and scaling by the radar wavelength yields the relative velocity of the target. Returning to range measurement, let us now imagine that our target range increases. We can see how its return becomes correspondingly later and eventually falls within the second receiving period. The periodicity of the pulse modulation means that the previous transmitted pulse, the one out of sight beyond the left hand end of the diagram, now gives rise to a return in the corresponding range gate of the first receiving period as shown here. A return received within the first receiving period is termed a first trace echo and in this case gives the false impression of a close range target. A return in the second receiving period is termed a second trace echo and happens to correspond to the true target range here. Of course, if the radar has the detection range, it may be possible to detect even more distant targets as third or fourth or higher order trace returns. But the radar here is aware of a return having an apparent delay time t and it is not to know that the true delay time is in fact t plus tr. Remember, tr is the time between pulses all of which means that there could be multiple solutions for the range, as given by the equation here, corresponding to multiple possible delay times. This is range ambiguity. This range ambiguity is avoided if we could guarantee all target returns to be first trace. In other words, being sure that the time delay t is less than the pulse repetition interval tr. The limiting case is shown here and corresponds to a delay time t equaling the PRI. Such a return falls coincident with the next transmitted pulse and so the receiver would be isolated. Therefore this target falls at an eclipsed range but nevertheless this is the limiting case which just about avoids range ambiguity. In this limiting case, the time delay is TR and the range is known as the maximum unambiguous range, RMU. Since the PRF is the inverse of TR, any given PRF has an associated maximum unambiguous range, given by the equation you see here. To guard against range ambiguity, the maximum unambiguous range 
must exceed the maximum detection range of the radar, that is, the maximum possible range at which very large targets or powerful clutter returns could ever be detected. Long detection ranges demand even longer maximum unambiguous ranges and hence ever lower PRFs. This leads to the concept of a low PRF, which is simply defined as being a PRF low enough to avoid range ambiguity. This was, historically, how early pulsed radars were designed, and low PRF modes are still used today in certain applications. One cannot define a general numerical frequency limit for low PRF since this is dictated by the radar's detection range. The following example illustrates this point. If the maximum range at which targets could be detected is given as 100 kilometers, then we might design for a somewhat higher value, say 150 kilometers. The extra margin caters for the possibility of detecting much larger targets or more powerful clutter returns than anticipated and so gives us a safety margin. Setting the maximum unambiguous range to 150 kilometers requires a time between pulses of 1 millisecond and therefore, inverting this, a PRF of 1 kilohertz. Any PRF less than or equal to 1 kilohertz avoids range ambiguity and is a low PRF. Another radar may be designed for a maximum unambiguous range of just 15 kilometers, in which case the low PRF criterion requires PRFs no greater than 10 kilohertz. And yet another radar designed for a maximum unambiguous range of 1,500 kilometers would set the low PRF limit to 100 hertz. The longer the range, the lower the PRF. Low PRF gives emphasis to the measurement of range. Low PRF has a narrow Doppler band and does have some velocity measurement capability, but the narrow Doppler band can be overwhelmed by wideband clutter, as will be incurred from a fast-moving radar platform, and so its application in airborne radar is limited to above-horizon search and tracking modes. Low PRF pulse Doppler is used extensively in ground-based surveillance systems. Returning to the earlier depiction of range ambiguity, we can expand the earlier equation for the various range solutions into the sum of two terms. The first term is the apparent range, based on a time delay t, and the second term is based on a time delay equaling multiples of the PRI. These terms can be further simplified into the apparent range and multiples of the maximum and ambiguous range. We saw earlier that low PRF avoids range ambiguity. However, range ambiguity is a feature of medium PRF, and probably also high PRF, which is what we are about to look at. In much the same way that range ambiguity is incurred if the target range delay could exceed the PRI, so too would Doppler ambiguity arise if the Doppler shift could exceed the limits of the Doppler band, that is, if the difference between the maximum positive Doppler and maximum negative Doppler exceeds the PRF. As we watch the Doppler shift increase and decrease, we can see that the central frequency component can indeed go beyond the band of minus a half the PRF to plus a half the PRF. But note also that just as the central component is shifted outside this band, one of the Doppler shifted PRF lines falls into this band. This is why a Doppler bandwidth equal to the PRF must be processed, since this band captures one and only one frequency component for each moving target. Superimposing the Doppler filters with a strong target response, we can ascertain the apparent Doppler shift of the target 
as being its frequency offset from the zero Doppler reference. But due to the repetition of the spectrum in the frequency domain at multiples of the PRF, this target response is also ambiguously repeated in frequency at multiples of the PRF. Each line in the transmitted spectrum, the black spectral lines, is Doppler shifted to give the blue spectral lines of the received spectrum. This now raises doubt over the true Doppler shift of the component seen within the Doppler band. It could be that this results from the negatively shifted first PRF line above the carrier, that is, a Doppler shift of minus PRF plus the apparent Doppler FD. Then again, it could be a large positive shift of the first PRF line below the carrier through a Doppler shift of plus the PRF plus the apparent FD. Indeed, there are multiple alternative possibilities of larger Doppler shifts of higher order PRF lines. So, the system measures an apparent Doppler shift FD but in truth, the true Doppler shift could have been the apparent value plus or minus multiples of the PRF. When scaled to velocity, we now have multiple ambiguous possibilities given by the equation here. This illustrates Doppler ambiguity, which of course leads to velocity ambiguity. The issue of velocity ambiguity leads us naturally to the idea that there is a maximum value of Doppler shift, both in the positive and negative frequency directions, that just about avoids ambiguity. Target responses at the maximum unambiguous Doppler, both positive and negative, are shown here. The maximum unambiguous Doppler is plus a half the PRF and minus a half the PRF. So, Doppler would be unambiguous if it can be guaranteed to lie within the band of plus or minus PRF divided by 2, a total spread in Doppler equal to the PRF. Substituting this into the earlier equation relating the velocity to the Doppler shift gives the result that there is a maximum unambiguous velocity given by plus or minus the wavelength times the PRF divided by 4. To avoid velocity ambiguity, one has to ensure that all targets that the radar is ever likely to detect have velocities within this interval. Accommodating high speed targets requires the use of a high value of PRF. The faster the targets, the higher the PRF that is required for any given wavelength in order to avoid velocity ambiguity. This leads to the concept of a high PRF waveform. Here the PRF is set sufficiently high so as to avoid velocity ambiguity. In this case the PRF is chosen such that the maximum unambiguous velocity is always greater than the maximum target velocity ever likely to be encountered. So high PRF is simply defined as a PRF high enough to avoid velocity ambiguity. Again, it's worth noting that no general frequency limits can be quoted here since this depends on the radar wavelength and maximum target velocities. High PRF gives emphasis to the measurement of velocity and is therefore useful in velocity search and tracking modes. In most cases, the requirement for high PRFs to avoid velocity ambiguity clashes with the requirement for low PRFs to avoid range ambiguity. Returning to the earlier illustration of velocity ambiguity, we can break the equation for the ambiguous velocity solutions down into the sum of two terms. The first of these is the apparent velocity associated with the apparent Doppler shift, 
and the second adds and subtracts even multiples of the maximum unambiguous velocity. As we have just seen, high PRF is defined in terms of a PRF sufficiently high to avoid velocity ambiguity. It does not require that range be ambiguous, although this may often follow as a consequence of using such a high PRF. Likewise, low PRF is defined in terms of a PRF sufficiently low to avoid range ambiguity. It does not require that velocity be ambiguous, although this may follow as a consequence of using such a low PRF. Velocity ambiguity is, however, a feature of medium PRF, and maybe also low PRF, especially from a fast-moving radar platform. Medium PRF has ambiguities in both range and velocity. In spite of this, it is a popular waveform because it is well suited to a wide spread of target ranges and velocities and can cope with high clutter situations. Both low and high PRF have circumstances where they work well, but both are also prone to severe clutter-related problems. The severity of these problems is much reduced through the use of a medium PRF value, but the price one pays for this is, in part, the complexity of decoding the true range and velocity from the ambiguous data. Decoding the true range and velocity can be accomplished by comparing the ambiguous data seen in several medium PRFs. Data in a minimum number, typically three PRFs, is required. In order to recover data in at least three PRFs, a schedule of many more PRFs, typically eight, must be used. In general, data in M out of N PRFs is required, and this also becomes a condition for declaring a target detection. The additional threshold of the M of N criterion adjusts the detection performance of the radar. The use of N sequential PRFs entails N processing intervals, one in each PRF, and also requires the beam dwell time to be sufficient to accommodate these N processing intervals. Time constraints limit the value of N and the duration of each processing interval, which in turn limits the processing gain and hence the range and also the velocity resolution of the radar. Clutter responses are also ambiguous and are seen at apparent ranges and velocities which vary with the PRF used. Thus, regions of high clutter are PRF dependent and the variation of the PRF causes variation in regions of high clutter. With sufficient PRF diversity, targets of interest are more likely to be detected in regions of low clutter in at least M of the PRFs. Additionally, targets of interest are more likely to avoid eclipsed ranges and regions of main beam clutter rejection in the requisite MPRFs. In this way, medium PRF waveforms with a carefully selected set of PRFs offer good all-round target detectability, even in high clutter conditions. The principles of medium PRF operation may also be applied in low or high PRF to solve the velocity and range ambiguities and circumvent the blindness issues of the low and high PRF regimes. An alternative medium PRF strategy is to first use a multi-PRF schedule to establish the initial range and velocity of a target, as previously described, and then subsequently to use a single medium PRF to track the target. The single medium PRF gives ambiguous range and velocity, but because the initial values are known, changes in range and velocity may be tracked. The radar may periodically recheck the target's true range and velocity by temporarily going back to a multi-PRF schedule or another waveform. As the target range and velocity change, the target response will from time to time approach a region of eclipsed range or main beam clutter rejection. 
the radar tracker detects this situation and initiates a change of the medium PRF to keep the ambiguous target response away from blind ranges and velocities. The radar would typically have several PRFs all in the medium PRF regime to select from, which are chosen to maintain good target detection over the full range and velocities of interest. This technique is known as PRF switching and is popular in active radar seekers used in guided weapons. A simulation of an engagement against an airborne target using medium PRF switching is seen here. The display is the unambiguous range velocity detection space of the Pulse Doppler radar seeker aboard the anti-aircraft missile, which is used for guidance in the final stages of an engagement. It has a horizontal axis from zero velocity on the left to the maximum unambiguous velocity at the right-hand edge, and a vertical axis from zero range at the bottom to the maximum unambiguous range at the top. The maximum unambiguous range and velocity change as the PRF switches, and so the range and velocity scales are adjusted on each PRF change. Some other details of the simulation of the engagement are displayed here. The target is initially seen at an ambiguous range of 1.7 km and ambiguous velocity of 270 meters per second. Although the true values are 10 km and 1,100 meters per second. At the start of the simulation, the track is not very accurate and the radar switches PRF several times in quick succession to find a suitable PRF, but eventually decides on a good one. In time, the accuracy of the track improves and the PRF switching behaviour calms down. As the simulation plays, the range counts down and the timer increments. The target response reduces in range as the radar closes in on the target, but the velocity remains fixed. The eclipsed range is the dark blue stripe along the bottom of the display, and blind velocity occurs where main beam clutter and its ambiguous repetition in the velocity domain is filtered out, and is indicated by the dark blue stripes running vertically on the left and right hand edges of the display. As the target response nears one of these blind regions, the radar tracker initiates a change to a new PRF, such that the target response jumps to a new ambiguous range and velocity appropriate to the new PRF, but which is now well clear of the blind regions. In summary, we have seen how PRF selection falls into three different regimes, defined by their ambiguity characteristics. Low PRF avoids range ambiguity, whereas high PRF avoids ambiguity in velocity. Medium PRF, on the other hand, incurs ambiguity in both range and velocity, but has good all-round performance, even in the face of testing clutter conditions, because it cycles its operation over several medium PRFs. The strength of medium PRF lies in the careful selection of the combination of PRFs used in a schedule. Many competing issues must be taken into consideration when it comes to the selection of precise values of PRF. We hope you have found this video presentation interesting and useful. White Horse Radar has a range of video presentations in the same style as this one, but typically of an hour's duration. Our videos cover all aspects of radar technology, radar electronic warfare, microwave engineering and specialist microwave measurement techniques, data fusion and computer optimization. We can also supplement video presentations 
with a site visit to conduct tutorials and question and answer sessions to reinforce the topics covered in our video presentations and clear up any queries students may have. If you'd like to know more about our range of video presentations, please consult our website. The address is in the bottom right of the screen. Or contact us at the email address shown here. Thank you for your attention. Goodbye.